بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وآخرون اعترفوا بذنوبهم خلطوا عملا صالحا وآخر سيئا عسى الله أن يتوب عليهم إن الله غفور رحيم خذ من أموالهم صدقة تطهرهم وتزكيهم بها وصل عليهم إن صلاتك سكن لهم والله سميع عليم وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم اللهم إني أعوذ بك من شتات الأمر أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers, friends and elders, mothers and sisters One of the greatest differentiating factors between us and our pious predecessors is They exploited time objectively and we waste time casually Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah was once asked Describe Sahaba in a common definition. You see in the Sahaba and Hassan Basri himself was so great that someone describing Hassan Basri rahimahullah said, إِنَّهُمْ رُؤُنْ سَرِيرُهُ كَعَلَانِيَتِهِ وَقَوْلُهُ كَفِعْلِهِ إِذَا أَمَرَ بِمَعْرُوفٍ كَانَ أَعْمَلَ النَّاسِ بِهِ وَإِذَا نَهَا عَنْ مُنْكَرٍ كَانَ أَتْرَكَ النَّاسِ لَهُ وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ مُسْتَغْنِيًا عَنِ النَّاسِ زَاهِدًا بِمَا فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ وَرَأَيْتُ النَّاسَ مُحْتَجِينَ إِلَيْهِ طَالِبِينَ مَا عِنْدَهُ This is such an amazing description and being part of the fraternity of scholars or as they perceive us to be, may Allah make us amongst true ulama, this gives you a shiver in your back. Somebody asked regarding Hassan Basri that you live close to him, describe Hassan Basri to us. He said he is a man between whose private and personal life there's no disparity. If you get into his house or you see in his public life, he's one and the same person. It's very easy to create an image in public, but it's very, very difficult to deliver on that perception in our four walls of our house. In Muslim Sharif in the Muqaddama on page 20, there is the quotation of Abdullah bin Mubarak. He said, I had heard about Abdullah bin Khatal, Abdullah bin Muharril. I had heard about this person. And I read about him and I heard about him. I was so impressed about him, but I had not met him. That if I had to die without meeting him, and on the day of Qiyamah, Allah said to me, would you want to go to Jannah, Abdullah, or would you want to meet this man first and then go to Jannah? My passion to meet him was of such a caliber that I was prepared to put my, whole in, my entry into Jannah on hold momentarily. That Allah first I would meet this man and then go to Jannah. When you're hungry, you don't want to do anything but eat. When you're tired, you don't want to do anything but sleep. When you have a call of nature, you want to do nothing but get to a washroom. When Allah makes us amongst those that would be granted entry into Jannah, can you imagine the excitement, the anxiety, the jubilation that would grip the occupants on the day of Qiyamah to get into Jannah? لو خيرت بين أن أدخل الجنة وبين أن ألقى عبد الله لاخترت أن ألقاه ثم أدخل الجنة. If I was told on the day of Qiyamah, do you want to go straight to Jannah or do you want to meet this man first, see him, and then after that you can go? I would have probably said to Allah, Allah first let me meet the man. فلما رأيته, but then when I finally met him, I seen such a disparity and discrepancy. Between what I heard and what I seen, that leave alone an animal, I will give more regard to the droppings of an animal than sit with this man. Leave alone an animal, I will value the droppings of an animal. The droppings of an animal, I would say, is more precious than sitting with this man, simply because what I heard, what I was told, and what I seen was two different things. One of the great luminaries, Mulana Hussain Ahmad Madni Rahimahullah, a great intellectual giant, a great scholar. I heard from people who sat close to him. They mentioned that this man was such 
the more you came closer to him, the greater your impression became about him. And that was the quality actually of our Habib sallallahu alayhi wasallam. To be impressed with a man at an arm's length from a distance, it, it, it's very easy. It's the whole world today, we're just creating images, creating images. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam was the only human whose most private life could be exposed in public and it only gave a fragrance, there was no stench in it. The most private, the most intricate, the most personal aspects of our beloved Habib sallallahu life could come out in the domain and in that there's guidance and, 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 and you know, navigation for the ummah. So anyway, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, someone asked regarding Hassan al-Basri, he said, innahum ru'un sariruhu ka'alaniyati. He's a man in whose private and personal life there's harmony. وَقَوْلُهُ كَفِعْلِهِ There's absolute, his utterances are synchronized with his actions. His utterances are synchronized. A villager who reverted to Islam, he said, لَقَدْ دَلَّنِي عَلَى هَذَا النَّبِيِّ الْأُمِّي أَنَّهُ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِخَيْرٍ إِلَّا كَانَ أَوَّلَ آخِذٍ بِهِ وَلَا يَنْهَا عَنْ شَرٍ إِلَّا كَانَ أَوَّلَ تَارِكٍ لَهُ The thing that impressed me about Muhammad sallallahu was, I never heard him utter an act of virtue, but that he executed it. And I never heard him prohibit a vice, but that he was the most distant individual from him. And I think probably that is our biggest setback. And that is the biggest snag we face on a macro, on a micro and on a macro level. As a father, as a guardian, as a custodian to my kids. Listen, boys, don't do this here. Don't smoke, don't use vulgar, don't peruse porn, don't do this, don't do that. But my children are watching, they observe. And one of my scholars used to say, and I really like this and I identify. He said, everybody is observing your shenanigans. Some are silent out of dignity and others are silent out of desperation. But no one's blind. Some are silent, well, you know what, my job will be compromised. The lift club will be jeopardized. There's so many other things that would implicate. It's a family issue. Why get, why get yourself involved? Why get yourself? Why tarnish yourself? Why soil yourself? And others are dignified. Now, well, his life, he should know better what he's doing. He should think for himself. But Allah is observing, but even the creation of Allah is observing. وَقُلِ عَمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَسَتُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Say unto them, اِعْمَلُوا دُو فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ Allah and His Nabi is observing and the believers are also observing. The believers are also observing. So anyway, what did he say? Who was Hassan Basri? إِنَّهُمْ رُؤُنْ سَرِيرُهُ كَعَلَانِيَتِهِ وَقَوْلُهُ كَفِعْلِهِ إِذَا أَمَرَ بِمَعْرُوفٍ كَانَ أَعْمَلَ النَّاسِ بِهِ وَإِذَا نَهَا عَنْ مُنْكَرٍ كَانَ أَتْرَكَ النَّاسِ لَهُ وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ مُسْتَغْنِيًا عَنِ النَّاسِ زَاهِدًا بِمَا فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ وَرَأَيْتُ النَّاسَ مُحْتَجِينَ إِلَيْهِ I noticed that he kept himself independent from the things of people. He was never one that was hankering behind the material pursuits of others. And I found people always converging around him to draw from his knowledge. So Khalid, Hasbuka ya Khalid, Khalid who was narrating this profile of Hassan Basri, the person said to him, Hasbuka ya Khalid, Khalid, that's adequate. Kayfa, and this is such a rich tribute of Hassan Basri, Kayfa ya dhillu qawmun fihim mithlu hadha. How can a nation deviate whose leaders are like this? How can a nation lose its moral compass whose leaders are like this? You know, there's a beautiful quotation in Tampihul Ghafirin, and this gives us each to reflect because we live in a world where it's very easy to pass the buck on. I often say, Sahaba were a group of people who used to deflect praise and embrace criticism. We deflect criticism and embrace praise. Sahaba were people that used to deflect praises. No, 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 that's not for me, that's for him. That was Sahaba. They were not out searching, hankering, waiting for praises. No, no, they were happy to pass it on to others. But when criticism came, they were ready to take it on. And we the direct opposite. When it comes to criticism, he was talking to you. No, he was implying you. It's everybody else. 
And when it comes to the prayers, immediately we just want to come forward. Unfortunately, that is our condition. May Allah protect us. So anyway, Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, this great scholar, he had the opportunity of interacting with the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum. They cannot be a greater honor. Someone asked Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, regarding Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was known as the second Umar, and regarding Sayyidina Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu, who was the scribe of revelation, the brother-in-law of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was a greater individual, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz or Sayyidina Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu? Sayyidina Muawiyah radiyallahu was the brother-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the scribe of revelation. Allahum mahdi Muawiyah wahdi bihi. Allah guide Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu and guide people through Muawiyah. Katibul wahyi. Someone whom the Nabi of Allah delegated the colossal task to capture revelation. You can imagine what a rich accolade this is that you trust in him with revelation. And what did Sayyidina Imam Shafi rahimahullah said? He said, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and his likes. And this was a man of absolute justice. He was a second Umar. Read his error. His error was a fresh breath. His era brought great calmness to the Muslim land. During his era, there were numerous occasions when you would see the wolf and the sheep drink from a common well. This is mentioned in Tafsir Kabir. So a shepherd came and he looked at the strange sight and was like, wow, how did this happen? We cannot even see mother-in-law and daughter-in-law walk together. Leave alone wolf and sheep. That's become, nowadays you don't even see father and son. It's a rare sight. It's a rare sight where father and son are talking or sitting together. It's just, you know, business related. And that's about it. They cannot share a discussion. They cannot talk together. Amr ibn As radiallahu, when he was in the throes of death, his son was there at his bedside, the conqueror of Egypt. Dad, you're in the throes of death. Sifli al maut. Can you perhaps describe what your emotions and feelings are? I don't want to be insensitive to the moment, but once you pass on, nobody will tell me what's death all about. Can you tell me what's your feelings? Sadri. <laughs> oh my son, it's like the mountains of the world are exclusively on the chest of your father. <laughs> and who is Amr ibn al As, the conqueror of Egypt? And then he slips into a coma. Then he comes out of that and he's conscious. So the son nudges him, Dad, sorry, you were saying, and then you passed on. Are you back there? Can we talk? You were saying like the mountains of the entire world are on your bosom. And I feel like I'm gasping for breath from the eye of a needle. And then he said those famous couplets or duas. Allahumma innaka amartana fa'asayna wa nahaytana famantahayna wa la yas'una illa afwuk. Allahumma la qawiyun fa'antasir wa la bari'un fa'a'tadhir wa la mustankirun bal mustaghfirun. Allah, you told me to do a lot of things in my life. Unfortunately, I did not oblige. Allah, you told me to abstain from a lot. Tragically, I did not restrain. Allah, my hopes are only in your mercy and nothing else. Allah, I want to be upfront. I'm not strong that I'm going to take on the angel of death. I'm not going to take him on. I'm not strong, Allah. Allahumma la qawiyun fa'antasir. Wa la bari'un fa'a'tadhir. And I'm not innocent that I'm going to argue my innocence. I'm not innocent that I'm going to argue my innocence. In this world, you argue, you, you, you know, you speak, you defend, you lie, you do a, th a thousand things. Yawma yahshuruhum wallahu jami'an. فَيَحْلِفُونَ لَهُ كَمَا يَحْلِفُونَ لَكُمْ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ Allah says, many of the disbelievers, as they spoke lies in this world, they will try and speak a lie on the day of Qiyamah, thinking perhaps it's going to buy them time there. But it's not going to help them in any way. Anyway, way to where? I'm saying we live in a world where there is no bonding, there is no time, there is no togetherness. We were just speaking now, and I mentioned it recently also in some of my talks. We're living in a world of digital consumption. Last week on one of the local radio stations, there was a discussion and I tuned in. YouTube records 100 billion hours of viewing daily. 
What staggering facts are that? Figures. 100 billion hours of viewing daily. Where is the Ummah's time gone? Hassan Basri said, I stayed with the Sahaba and that's the focus of my talk. أَدْرَقْتُ أَقْوَامًا كَانَ أَحَدُهُمْ أَشَحَّ عَلَىٰ عُمْرِهِ مِنْهُ عَلَىٰ دِرْهَمِهِ Digest this profound statement. If I have to summarize the Sahaba in one statement, then who were the Sahaba? They were a nation who were very possessive over time and very generous with wealth. You could get any amount of money out of them. They were easy. Money, take it. No issues. How much you want? Sahaba were casual. When it came to money, they could give tens of thousands. In fact, there is an amazing incident. I was just teaching it the other day, so I have a flash of it. I'll just share it with you. On the occasion of Badr, the Messenger Sallallahu uncle Abbas radiallahu was captured. He was part of the captives. He wasn't a Muslim at that time. And he had come with a large amount, 700 gold coins, which was great value. And he was captured by the Muslims. He was apprehended. His assets were intercepted. And then he, he came forward. And then uh, each captive had to give a ransom to buy his freedom. So Abbas radiallahu at that stage was not a Muslim. So he asked the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, listen, I came with a lot of money and the Muslims have captured me and they've also taken my money. Can't you just con assume the money that they have taken from me as a ransom? The money that I have been apprehended, I have been made a captive and the money that has been taken, just take that as a ransom. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, the time at which you were apprehended, you were intercepted, you were coming to fight against us, you were not a believer and at that stage as well, he was still not a believer. So this is booty to the Muslims. This is booty to the Muslims. You will have to give your ransom. And Allah revealed the verse. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu qul liman fi aydikum min al-asra. In ya'lam illahu fi qulubikum khayra. In ya'lam illahu fi qulubikum khayra. O Muhammad s.a.w. say to these captives that are in your hands and in your possession. That if you are sincere in your heart and you are honest and you have good intentions then Allah will give you much more than the wealth that was taken from you. Abbas radiallahu said, I am a living statistic of this ayah. At the stage that this had happened, I was not a believer. Then I was taken as a captive. My family had to give money to get my ransom. I then accepted Islam. Allah gave me so much wealth, so much wealth. At that time, I had lost 700 coins. Now, at any given time, I have minimum 20 slaves. And each one's income is in excess of 20,000 dirhams. Anyway, coming back to the point, I said, Hassan Basri describing the Sahaba, that they were a group of people, when it came to money, their hand was loose. They say in English, my father told me, a young boy says, Oh, my son, there are two types of people. They are the givers and the takers. The takers, they eat better. The givers, they sleep better. Oh my son, there are two types of people in the world. There are those that give and there are those that take. By Allah, I have seen with my eyes in my travels, people who have a greater ecstasy in giving than the general public have in receiving. There are those individuals, may Allah make us amongst them. If there is a quality that is loved by Allah, it's generosity. Imam Shafi said, وَإِن كَثُرَتْ عُيُوبُكَ فِي الْبَرَايَا وَسَرَّكَ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهَا غِطَاءُ تَسَتَّرْ بِالسَّخَائِ فَكُلُّ عَيْبٍ يُغَطِّيهِ If you regret, lament your wrong and you want to expedite your spiritual growth, your safest avenue is generosity. That's a guaranteed avenue. Span and span. It would camouflage, conceal your wrong and expedite your growth in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sahaba were very, very possessive when it came to time. There was a structured timetable. By and large today, we don't have a timetable in our life, which is a recipe for disaster. A believer has to have an active timetable and he cannot slip out of this timetable for him to be productive in this world and in Akhirah. 
The, du the dua I recited before you is one of the teachings of Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min shatatil amr. Allah, I ask thy divine protection from my matters being disorganized. Nowadays we have organized chaos. From my matters being disorganized, a believer has to be systematic. The infidels of Makkah in the 18 Juz in Surah Mu'minun, Allah highlights many of their evil traits. They did this, they did this, they did this here. And Allah says there were three things which was an impediment, a hurdle and an obstacle to their growth. And if we look at this carefully, microscopically, I'm afraid we are guilty of all three of them. مُسْتَكْبِرِينَ بِهِ سَامِرًا تَهْجُرُونَ Just half an ayah. This is the beauty of the Qur'an. May Allah give us the love to connect with the Qur'an. مُسْتَكْبِرِينَ بِهِ سَامِرًا تَهْجُرُونَ Allah said three things kept these infidels away from truth. Number one, they were arrogant about it. مُسْتَكْبِرِينَ بِهِ They were arrogant about it. They were haughty and proud. Now the scholars of Tafsir tell us that in the text of this ayah, the he, there is no marja. In other words, previously in the ayah, there's nothing been discussed to which Allah is referring. But there is consensus of the scholars of Tafsir. Here it refers to the Kaaba. And the reason why it has not been preceded by any mention because the link and the attachment and the association and the affiliation and the affinity that they had with the Kaaba was known. Regarding a person, he is always with him. So with who? Or who else? So you use a, a vague, unclear reference. You don't explicitly mention it. You implicitly hint it. But everybody knows precisely who you're talking about. And that's exactly the tone of this ayah. They're very proud about it. And what's the reference? They were very proud about the fact that they were the custodians of the Kaaba. And they felt an A about this year. They felt arrogant about this. And may Allah save us from pride and arrogance. You know, in English they say, and this really hits me because it's so profound, a mistake which makes you humble is better than a virtue which makes you arrogant. A mistake which makes you humble we're not condoning the mistake. Let me qualify my statements. We're not condoning the wrong, but it makes you humble. There is an incident in Babul Ujb, in Babul Ujb, in, in Tambihul Ghafilin, uh, regarding one of the pious predecessors. He said, لَأَنْ أَبِيتَ نَائِمَا وَأُصْبِحْ نَادِمَا If I spend the night sleeping and I don't engage in nocturnal prayer, and we're not talking of Fajr prayer, we're talking of optional prayer, and I get up in the morning re regretting this, this is more dear to me than spend the entire night in ibadat and get up conceited and elated and inflated that I'm better than others. It's such a sensitive thing, my brothers. It's so sensitive. I always say, and I'll repeat this, if there's three things which I have advocated in all my talks, and if anybody can, can ever have any memory of me, let it be these three things. One is give charity daily. Number two, value your parents lovingly and sincerely, whether alive or deceased. And number three, don't judge any person. I live by this and I die by this year. Give charity daily. Value your parents because that is the closest gateway to Jannah. Your mom is paradise, your dad is the door to paradise. And number three, don't be judgmental on any person. لَأَنْ أَبِيتَ نَائِمَا وَأُصْبِحْ نَادِمَا if I spend the entire night sleeping and I get up, oh man, I regret. It's better than spending the night in ibadah and getting up with a condescending eye on others. Well, you wasted your night. What good is there in what you did? So Allah said three things kept them away from truth. They were arrogant on their virtuous actions. So it was the day of Jum'ah. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu was at the mimbar. Sayyidina Abbas radiallahu was there and a third Sahabi. And they started enumerating their own accolades. Abbas radiallahu said that, well, I have the privilege that I am the custodian of the Kaaba and I give water to the pilgrims. And somebody else said, well, I have this access to the Kaaba. 
And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, I don't really identify with what you people are saying. All I know is I accepted Islam. I do what I was told to do. And I have participated in campaigns with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there is a bit of an argument and a back and forward altercation regarding which action is more superior than the other. Sayyidina Umar came close. He said, leave this. It's Juma time. After Juma, we'll ask the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that was the privilege Sahaba had. And then the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and the Jummah Salah was performed and then the verses were revealed. أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ كَمَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَجَاهَدَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ الذين آمنوا وهاجروا وجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم في سبيل الله أعظم درجة عند الله وأولئك هم الفائزون. Have you equated? Have you equated giving water to the pilgrims and establishing the sacred house to the young man who accepted iman and spent his health and wealth in participating in the campaigns with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. They cannot be equal. لا يستوون عند الله. The action of Ali surpasses the actions of others. The point that I'm saying is that the kuffar of Mecca, three things, they were arrogant on what they did. We do little, we speak about it, and we destroy what we have. May Allah protect us. May Allah grant us humility. I often say, brothers, and I'll say it again, do one thing in your life. And may Allah give it to me, the ability, and to you. So secret that you don't whisper it to your partner, you don't, because when we do some good action, a little while we quiet, after a little while, there's this itch within us. I need to tell my wife. I need to inform this one here. I need to tell this person here. We won't keep anyone abreast with all our wrongs, but we're very quick. You know what? In case somebody comes and gives you a receipt, just accept it. It's some donation I gave a few years ago. It's some donation I gave a few years ago. Do one action secretly in the dead of night. When nobody knows it, nothing, 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 just that absolute action, hopefully that would secure our abode on the day of Qiyamah. So that was the first evil trait, mustakbirin. They were proud on their association to the Kaaba. The second thing Allah said, samiran. Samiran in Arabic, samura literally means a moonlit night. And look at the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. So it was customary amongst the Arabs when it was moonlit night, they would sit outside and they would just chit chat. They would just sit and discuss and they would just kill time. Last year I was in Sydney for a program and then after the program they took us out to eat and after we ate, we, it was in the CBD so we were passing through town and we passed by this place which has become a common thing nowadays where people are sitting, congregating at a cafe and having shisha and indulging. And I said, hundreds of Muslim youth, you could see from their features and their appearance. And Allah be my witness, the pain that gripped my heart. I guess it's happening everywhere, but I never had the exposure to it. Because often in our own homes, environments, at those late hours, you're not outside. But when you're traveling, the dynamics and the demographics change, location, travel, airport, hotel, etc. And you, when you get exposure to a thing, the pain is different. When you hear of it and you get exposure. When Sayyidina Musa a.s. was at Mount Tur and he heard that his nation was worshipping the calf, it enraged him. But when he came there and he literally seen it, He put the Torah down, he gripped his brother Harun and he dragged him and he said, like, Harun, what's this all happening in my absence? And Harun pacified him and said, relax my brother. I was trying to stop them, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, abandon, abandon it. And I feared that perhaps it results in dividing Bani Israel, which I chose not to do. So when you see it, the pain is much more. You, you receive a call at home, you know, this is what's happening at the office, come home. So one is you're disturbed, you're alarmed, you're appalled by the news. But when you get home and you see it, it's a different thing altogether, the pain. So to see the youth killing time, burning money, destroying resources, unfortunately is the most painful eye, is the most painful thing to the eye. So they would sit, the Arabs would sit for hours and hours and just sit and talk and pass time. And how often this has become the norm, my brother. We have a barbecue night, a bry night, a social night. 
It's no longer we having a walima spend the, have lunch with us, spend the afternoon with us, spend the day with us. And then inevitably the third thing that happens, it ties up. Samiran is just sitting and chit-chatting. Hence the Prophet said, La samurata ba'd al isha. Or look at the words of Habib sallallahu No social discussions post isha. No sleep in pre isha. No social discussions post isha. One hadith of the Prophet وسلم, if the world can, can internalize this and can embrace this, I promise the world out there would be much more productive the next morning. People will not be so lame, lethargic and non-active. But this is the sad reality that it just runs into the late hours and the morning is a lazy morning and a lazy start. And then thank God it's Friday and that's, that's the way life has become. So what happens with these to sit and kill hours and hours and speak. And in that discussion, what's the third inevitable thing? Tahjurun. Tahjurun means they used to blurt nonsense. They used to blurt nonsense. When you sit in and you chat in and it's men alone or woman alone, are you going to be making ibadat? Talking zikr? What, what's the inevitable discussions? I don't need to spell it out. I don't need to spell it out. Right? The munafiqeen were going with the Prophet وسلم, in Tabuk. Some of them declined, some participated, some made lame excuses. Some of the villages they came to make excuses. And those who denied Allah, they, they didn't even bother to come and extend an apology. Not to say that the munafiqeen who extended apologies were genuine. Because they came and said, no, we cannot join you. But really we wanted to participate. And Allah said that if they really wanted to participate, If they really wanted to do the act, they would have started some preparation. But tell them it's not like they didn't participate. Allah despised their participation, so Allah denied them participation. When the Munafiqeen used to sit in the gathering and then they say, Okay, هل يراكم من أحد? Is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seen? No. Okay, sneak, sneak. Then they would leave. Allah said, you didn't leave, we got rid of you. You didn't leave, we got rid of you. يَتَسَلَّلُونَ مِنْكُمْ لِوَاذَا they would take shelter from the backs of each others and sneak out. Allah diverted their heart away. Allah blocked their heart. Allah sealed their heart. Allah barred their heart. May Allah protect us. There are some actions when you perpetrate it, apart from the sin, it, it's, it's the cause of hypocrisy entering your heart and blocking virtue for the rest of your life. Sometimes when a son is disrespectful to his parent, one is that wrong, but that disrespect becomes an impediment for future growth and prosperity. Then we allowed hypocrisy to permeate their hearts. Till the day they meet Allah. So the ulama write under this ayah, there are some evil actions. That the benefits or the harm of that evil is not limited to that advice, but it goes way beyond. It goes way beyond. Anyway, some munafiqeen joined, and as they were going, they started talking. So while they were started talking, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah will give us victory in Tabuk. So these munafiqeen who started talking, now you're having a social discussion and you're chit chatting. So, this Prophet Billah, in a mockery, in a condescending, he's dreaming. He's dreaming that he's going to conquer, you know, uh, Tabuk and he's going to return victorious. One remark. Second remark, some of these uh, Sahaba, Billah, the reference of these people, they're quite obese. Their bellies are protruding. Uh, they're quite big in size, making these nasty comments and remarks about their features. And, and their disposition and, and, and their, uh, you know, structures, etc. 
One Sahabi heard this, he intercepted, he said, Oh Nabi of Allah, these people are making remarks like this here, that you dreaming, you fantasizing, and then they're mocking at this one's body and that one's image. You know, one day Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi I'll come back to this incident, one day Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Abdullah ibn Mas'ud to climb on a tree and just break off a twig as a miswak. So as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu was climbing on and he got on and he was, he was plucking off the twig, his shin got exposed of his foot. Now his foot was very lean and very frail. So some people inadvertently, unintentionally, they just had a bit of a chuckle. <coughs> so Nabi Sallallahu said, what's the laughter about? They said, no, min diqqati saqi. We've seen his legs are so thin. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِيهِ I swear by Allah, this is an authentic hadith, I swear by Allah in his control is my life, the leg of Abdullah might be thin, weak and frail, but this will have more muscle, cloud and weight on the scale of good deeds on the day of Qiyamah than Mount Uhud. And on the other hand, you could be pumping iron, my brother. And you could be, you know what, burning calories and you could have all your packs together. And you could have the biceps, but on the day of Qiyamah, it carries no weight, no strength. Like Allama Shabir Ahmad Uthmani writes, and I marvel at this analogy of his. He says, the growth that comes to your wealth through haram is like obesity setting into your wealth. That is not healthy expansion, that is obesity, that's fatness in your wealth. So the money a person is eating his burgers and fries and indulging and he's really growing and you say, hey, this guy must be strong. No, 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 no. That expansion is more of a liability than an asset. Leave alone helping anyone else. He cannot carry himself. He's a risk to himself. So when your money is growing through haram, that's not healthy expansion. That's obesity expanding. Through the naked eye, through the naive eye, through the foolish eye, you would say that's a healthy man, that's a huge man, that's a big man. But hang on, he's more susceptible, more vulnerable to this medical condition, to that medical condition. Why? Because until the belly doesn't tone down and he doesn't get into, into shape, he's, he's exposed to a thousand challenges. So anyway, they made these remarks. It was intercepted. It was then passed to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, Nabi of Allah, this is what they're saying. Nabi Sallallahu said, are you people sitting and gossiping and talking these type of things? I mean, let's look at some of our chat groups and our social discussions. You cannot believe how much time of the Ummah is burning away and the kind of things we're talking on it. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ لَيَقُولُنَّ إِنَّمَا كُنَّا نَخُوذُ وَنَلْعَبْ قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ and when you quiz them and you engage them, that listen, are you folks talking this? No, no, we, we were just joking, man. We were just kidding. We were just kidding. We were just in humor, man. Just having a bit of lightheartedness. So Allah says this, and let me sound a word of caution. Sometimes in our jokes, we cross the line. We trust, we trans, you know, we trespass the boundaries. Allah asked the question, قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ so you mock, you joke, you laugh, you scoff at Allah, at his Nabi. How often people make these jokes? Those are serious things, brothers, when we joke with Allah and his Nabi, when Allah was giving out brains and Adam is so lucky, he doesn't have a mother-in-law. Are those the things you, you joke about? Are those things you, you speak about? قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Do they mock Allah and his Nabi and his signs? لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا don't come and give us your lame excuses. قَدْ كَثَرْتُمْ You have uttered a statement of kufr. اَيْ قَدْ ظَهَرَ كُفْرُكُمْ بَعْدَ إِظْهَارِ إِمَانِكُمْ They claim to be believers. They were munafiq. Your disbelief has become exposed after your claim of iman. إِنَّ عَفُ عَنْ طَائِفَةٍ مِّنْكُمْ نُعَذِّبْ طَائِفَةً بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا مُجْرِمِينَ Those who repent will be pardoned. Those who persist will not be pardoned. So the point I'm saying is, we got to take care of our time. And what did the Quran say? Three things that destroyed them. Number one, arrogance on what they're doing. Number two, having social discussions. I had heard from one of my teachers regarding his ustad, that he had a cut of time of 10 p.m. He said he was so diligent, so religious, so meticulous, 
that at one time there was a jalsa taking place in which great, great international luminaries were present. But at that time, 10 o'clock, when the clock struck, stood up, excused himself and went to bed because next day I got to stand up and I got to be talking to my creator. You know, this incident of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, during when Alexandria was conquered, Muawiyah bin Khudayj was the envoy. So he came into Medina and he was looking for Sayyidina Umar. He said, it's midday. Sayyidina Umar would be resting. I'll meet with him later. So Sayyidina Umar's slave girl observed him and said, have you come back from Alexandria? Correct. You have news about the battle? Absolutely. Come to Umar now. No, I guess it's midday resting time. I'll come later. He says, no, no. Umar will insist that you must come now. Radiallahu. So he was brought in. And Umar was informed that when he came, he thought probably it wasn't appropriate. So he was going to stall it. So Umar radiallahu then took him to task for this. And he said, you came in. You know, we're anticipating the news. Why didn't you come straight and tell it to me? So he said to Umar, oh, Umar, I thought it's midday and you'll be resting and it's not appropriate to bother you at this time. And what did Sayyidina Umar say, my brother? What did Sayyidina Umar radiallahu say? He said, oh, Muawiyah, in nimtu nahara dayyatu ra'iyya wa in nimtu layl dayyatu nafsi fa kayfa nawm bayna hadayn. O oh, Muawiyah, if I sleep by day, when will I discharge the obligation of the creation? And if I sleep by night, when will I converse with my Allah? You find me time between these two duties and I'll put my head on the pillow. Imam Nawawi, the great Shafi'i scholar said, Ma wada'tu jambi ala firashi. For two years, I didn't consciously go to sleep. I just was moving on with, you know, while sitting, I was overwhelmed by sleep. Few hours and I slept away. While sitting, I slept. I didn't consciously sleep for two years. Like you would say, you know what? During busy season in December, I didn't have a meal for the last 10 days. Well, how are you living then? You know what I mean? Is a bite in a sandwich, taking a sip, just munching on something and moving on. I didn't sit down and have a meal. You're on the run and you're traveling for the last eight days. I didn't see what's a shower. Imam Nawawi says for two years I didn't sleep. Is when I was overpowered and overwhelmed. That was about it. This was making time meaningful. This was their time coming out in maximum dividends. So these were the three things that held the infidels of Makkah. Mustakbirin, Samiran, Tahjurun. Allah speaks about Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam and again I emphasize the same point, the need of time, the need of discipline, the need of structure. That when it is this time, this is how it is. And we have to create this, this schedule which we need to be diligent about. Let me share with you another ayah in this regard as well. Allah objects in the Quran and frowns on one of the strange practices of the pagans, the pagan Arab. They had some very peculiar practices. It's laughable when we look at it in their context. But when we look at it in our context, it's not laughable. You know, that's the nature of things. When you talk of somebody else doing it, it's a joke. But when somebody else talks about you, it's not such a joke. It's offensive. Mufti Taqi Uthmani has written that once I wrote an article against backbiting. So one professor wrote to me and he said, if backbiting is so evil, then, well, there's no pleasure left in life because what's so exciting in a social gathering other than backbiting? So he wrote me a straight article and he said, I mean, I, I, I beg to differ with you. If backbiting is so evil, then really you've taken out the essence of life. What do we do on a social get together besides gossip? So he said, no problem. That's fine. I take your point. And for a moment, I identify with your logic. Sayyidina Musa told the magicians, Alqu ma antum bulqoon. Challenge me. Throw what you need to throw. The ulama say he wasn't advocating them to challenge. They were going to do it. So he said, go for it. Go for it. So he said, listen, we're telling you this weekend we're having a get together and we're going to be gossiping about you. You're not invited. Like, no, 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 no. You know, please don't say that. Don't say that. Now, suddenly it has changed. The whole psychology, the whole approach, the whole attitude has changed. Why? Because you will be the point of discussion. And, and if only we can analyze everything through that same eye, that if it's bad for me, it must be bad for others. If it's good for me, it must be good for others. 
then I promise you we won't have this disparity and discrepancy in society. May Allah grant us that understanding through which we look at things. So anyway, I was saying regarding Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu was salam, the need of creating structure, discipline, and measure in everything that we do. So the, the Arabs had these different peculiar practices. One of their peculiar practices were that four months the Quran declares as sacred. That's an established fact in the Quran that from the time Allah created the heavens and the earth, minha arba'atun hurum, four are sacred. Right? In those months you wouldn't engage in battle, etc. The sanctity of these months, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ بِالْمَعَاصِ don't oppress yourself in these months and the months of the year by committing wrong. So look at the irony of their logic. And, and, and this is how we temper today with things. So amongst those months were Rajab. And this is what the scholars of Tafsir say. The alternation used to more often happen with the month of Rajab. So if they seen the need of battle during the month of Rajab, then the leader of a tribe will stand up and say, listen, we are in Rajab, but there's been a crisis for battle. So for this year, we're just going to shuffle the months. We delay in Rajab. We fast forward in the next month and we just put in this month on hold. It's like, listen, I'm busy this week. So we're going to be having Juma Friday on Sunday and Sunday we'll just bring it a little forward. So this was the kind of thing they used to do where they used to rotate months. Inna man nasi u ziyada. Nasi in Arabic means to delay. That is why you call credit also nasi. Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam stick. Allah says, min sa'ata. It is an isma'ala through which you move dirt and you clear out the way. Nasa'a to move things. Inna man nasi'u postponement. Inna man nasi'u ziyadatun fil kufri. Yudallu bihi alladheena kafaru. Yuhillunahu aama. Wa yuharrimunahu aama. One year it's sacred, one year it's not sacred. So this was one of their peculiar practices. Another peculiar practice, and that brings me to the aspect of preservation of time, is when they used to harvest crops, then they had this very distorted distribution. They used to say, this crop belongs to Allah. So they would help the wayfarer, they would help the widow, they would help the orphan. And these crops here belongs to our gods and our deities. So they would give it to the worshippers in the church, in their place of worship, and they would also offer it as sacrifice to their deities. This is what the Quran speaks about, that when they used to harvest, this is how they used to rotate and they used to distribute, which itself was a crime because everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقَالُوا هَذَا لِلَّهِ بِزَعْمِهِمْ وَهَذَا لِشُرَكَائِنَا فَمَا كَانَ لِشُرَكَائِهِمْ فَلَا يَصِلُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَمَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ فَهُوَ يَصِلُ إِلَى شُرَكَائِهِمْ But it gets even more ugly and more, more strange. That Allah said sometimes when they used to harvest the crops and the crops and the harvest and the fruit and the produce were all gathered in one place. So the share of Allah went in their inverted commas because everything belongs to Allah. But what they had allotted as the share of Allah got mixed with the share of the gods. They used to say it's fine man. Allah don't really need. Allah is easy going. Allah is independent. Allah is self-sufficient. So if we cut short here, there's no implications. But if the scenario was reversed and the share of their gods got mixed with the share of Allah, they were very quick to separate it. No, 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 no. Hey, please, man. There's half a kilo there. It's going to come this side. Yeah. Yeah. Please. 50 grams. Can you just push it this side? Yeah. Then, you know, we balance the egg out. Sa'ama yahkumun. Evil indeed with the decisions they made. Mufti Shafi Sahib Rahmatullahi writes so amazingly. He says, we read this ayah and we move on. We chuckle, we laugh, we mock, we snub and we move on. But let's direct the focus to us. We are no different. So you, we set a timetable for myself in the morning. I'm going to read so much tilawat. The night before I retire to bed, I got to read my yasin, my tabarak. In the morning, I got to go to the gym. I got to do this. Half an hour, I got to update myself with the news bulletins. Then I got to see the score. Then I had visitors coming home and my whole pattern got disrupted. Who bears the brunt of the disruption? Does my Jamin go? Does my news bulletin go? Or does my Yasin and my Tabarak go? And if perchance it took strain, the next day I am in the gym two hours more. Why well, last yesterday I lost out. But yesterday you didn't read. Allah is kind, but the intention was there, brother. The intention was there. You got to look at the intention, brother. You don't understand it. You don't understand. You can ask the ulama. The ulama will verify this. Am I right, Mullah? 
Correct. Once the intention was there, right? Visit this cave. Visit is an act of ibadat also, if you look at it. Oh, wow. 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 Amazing. Phenomenal. Like now we're running on 10 different opinions and verdicts. And we're running with a very broad aspect of things. So we frown, we moan, we groan, we laugh, we scoff at the pagan Arab in his deviation. That how he was quick to separate. But when it comes to us and our structure, and if we fall short in our commitment that daily I'm going to do this and we fall short, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a very good retirement package. I always say, nobody gives you a better retirement package than Allah. إِذَا مَرِيذَ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ سَافَرَ كُتِبَ لَهُ مِثْلُ مَا كَانَ يَعْمَلُ صَحِيحًا مُقِيمًا Right? All these packages, when it's time for them to pay out, there's so many clause, there's so many conditions, there's so much red tape, there's bureaucracy, there's protocol, there's, there's so much. Allah says, when a servant becomes ill or he embarks on journey, we record for him every action he performed while he was ill and healthy, or we capture for him every action he did while he was at home. When you're in journey and now the, the, the travel doesn't warrant, doesn't allow for it here. Yeah. Immediately, whatever you did. But look at us, how we unfortunately lose the plot. So one, two incidents and we draw it to a close. The incident of Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah had blessed him with a kingdom and a nabuwat. He was the first Nabi who was a king as well. And what did Allah give him advice in the Quran? We asked for advice, quick advice. Simple, basic, straightforward. What did Allah say? Ya Dawood, inna ja'alna ka khalifatan fil ard, fahkum bayna al-nasi bil haq, wa la tattabi'i al-hawa. That when you execute your verdict, don't follow your base desire. Today, unfortunately, we've lost that. It's my ego. What they say, drop the E and you'll go. But as long as you're holding on to that ego, you don't move. Just a quick thought, in the 17 Jews in Surah Anbiya, there's a detailed incident regarding two people. One was a shepherd and one had a farm. The shepherd had left his flock. So the flock pastured into the adjacent farm and destroyed the crops. Nafasha in Arabic means a flock of sheep without a shepherd. I'm going to simplify the logic, a class of students without a teacher. You can imagine the havoc that's going to happen there. Nowadays, even with the teacher. You know, let's say nowadays, you know what's it? Before it's silence. You know what? The, the children are learning. Now it's like silence. Some students are sleeping. Respect them. That's classroom manners now. Please, please, silence. Respect this. There are some students that are sleeping. Please, just, just respect them. That's, that's classroom mannerism now. The demographics have changed. We're dealing with a very, very different situation today. May Allah guide and protect our youth. Really, we are in, in very, very trying times. Anyway, long story short. So this shepherd, his flock had destroyed the farm, adjacent farm. The case was presented to Dawood alayhi salam. He analyzed the entire situation. And when he did the maths and the calculation, the harm that was caused by the flock of sheep to the adjacent farm balanced out to the value of the flock of sheep. So the harm that was done to the adjacent farmer's crops, his entire crops and harvest was destroyed. The value, the harm that he incurred was in proportion to the value of the sheep. So he said to the shepherd, listen, it's your negligence. If a dog is roaming and you don't have a leash and he bites someone, you're going to hold the owner responsible. So you're going to be liable and responsible because you were not taking care of your flock. So you're going to have to take your flock and you're going to have to give it over to this man because he has incurred loss and harm. So they said, okay, that's the verdict. And they come out. But these people were driven by truth, not driven by egos. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, obey the truth. Don't focus on who said it. Focus on what has been said. Don't focus on who said. We are such, even if it is a flawed decision, but if it comes from my beloved, we embrace it. And even if it's the absolute truth, but if it comes from my foe, we, we deny it. So they exit from the court of Dawood alayhi salam and as they walk in past, they pass Sulaiman alayhi salam. The narration of Jalalain in the footnotes, he was 13 years of age. So he's like, you guys are from my dad. Yeah, correct. What happened? No, we had this issue. Okay, what was my dad's verdict? Yeah, your dad basically pronounced a verdict due to my negligence. So I got to pass my flock over. Okay, perfect. That's fine. I'm just saying, if I was made to 
look into this case and pronounce a verdict here, my view would be respectfully fairly different from that of my venerable dad. I would look at an option that could minimize the harm that was caused to the shepherd because this way he's lost total. This man has lost his crops now, but in the years to come, he can irrigate and farm and plow and get his crops and he's got a whole flock of sheep. So the message was taken back to Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam. Dawood alayhi salam summoned his son bihaqqil ubuwati wa nubuwa. Oh my son, through the medium of prophethood and fatherhood, come here, I want to talk to you. You know, sometimes you tell your son, leave it. You don't know anything, man. And after a little while, you realize you don't know it. You know? But now, who's going to call the lighty back now? You know? Yeah, why don't you tell your son to do it? Yeah, I'm going. Now you first tell him, you know, you boys, you think. And sometimes these youngsters also, they push their luck too much. We need to strike the balance. Some youth, if they eat, he basically explained to his father a device or a gadget. He's like, I'm one notch above my dad. I'm one notch. You're born into technology, so you're abreast with it. That doesn't give you an upper hand over your father. If you need to explain to him, you do it with absolute respect. Ibrahim salam is known as the father of prophets. His father is known as the father of polytheists. Ibrahim salam is inviting his father to monotheism. He is one of the noblest of Allah's creation. The father being a sinful individual and a polytheist. The tone of the father is harsh and obstinate. The tone of Ibrahim is polite and gentle. Ya abati qad ja'ani min al-ilm ma lam ya'tika fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiya. Ya abati la ta'abud shaytan Ya abati inni akhafu an yamassaka azabun min ash... Oh my beloved dad. Uh, you my father, but listen, what you're doing is, is, is not right. Really, Dad, that's not how you do things. Dad, I'm just worried if you're going to carry on like this, Allah's azab is going to come. I have a flash of a young man who once came to me and he cried in my house and I won't forget that. He said, you know, Allah changed my life and my whole vision. And I came out in the path of Allah and I had a complete reformation to myself. My life changed. I went out, changed, brought modesty into my life, in my house. And the first thing I realized that my dad is dealing in interest. And I said, listen, this is not compatible because now my outlook of life has changed. So I sat my father down and I said, dad, you know what? This is, oh, go man, go from your back off. This whole investment is for you. This whole empire is for you. What do you mean we can't run it like this? Okay, I realized he's not accepting it. Time passed, I came back to him. I said, listen, dad, this is bothering me. Uh, it's, it's eating me up. No, no, you're mad, man. This is for my grandchildren. It bothered me again. After a few days, I came back. I said, dad, listen. I'm going to have to tell you, I want to relinquish my rights and I want to exit the family business and I admire this young man and I will become an employee in the business so I'm not liable for the wrongs of the business because I'm no longer a partner and I'm no longer an owner. An employee is not liable for the wrongs. So I'm relinquishing whatever you want to give me and this is not a proposal. This is respectfully I am informing you because I cannot be eating haram and nourishing my children with haram. And he cried and he said, I couldn't believe that I was in that same condition. I was in that same condition. And sometimes, brothers, we need a little bit patience. Sometimes we need a little bit patience. When we are in, uh, caught up in sin and vice, those around us have patience with us. And we come out of it. And when we come out of it, we lack the maturity to display the patience that was displayed with us for us to come out of our wrong. كَذَلِكَ كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَتَبَيَّنُوا There's one tafsir of this ayah. This was your condition before, O oh my sahaba. This was your condition oh, before, O oh my sahaba. There was a youngster who was having some issues in the marriage. Allah gave him, he died, he changed. His wife wasn't changing so positively. So they came home. I said to him, see brother, Allah gave you, he died. That's excellent. When you got married to your wife, you consciously knew the woman you were wedding. Absolutely. Right? Allah made it possible for you to make the drastic change, which is awesome, brilliant, and, and you know, rewarding. She hasn't yet taken the bold step. It's not that she fell back on her promise. This is how you wedded her. This is you consciously married her like this year. You went for new, you know, you went for a manual. Now you want the car to be automatic. I'm just using a loose phrase here. So you need patience, you need tolerance, you need forbearance. And sometimes, unfortunately, we lose it. Subhanallah, look at Sayyidina Dawud alayhi salam. He calls his son. Oh, my son, tell me what's the story. Dad, I would have told the shepherd that he takes his flock and he gives it to the farmer, not permanently, momentarily. 
يَنْتَفِعُ بِلَبَنِهَا وَسُوفِهَا وَنَسْلِهَا That you can draw, you know, milk the goats, take the milk, you can use the fur, you can use the skin, anything that is born now, what procreation you can have. In the interim, as the shepherd, you work on the fields now, plow, irrigate, plant. When you bring the crops back to where it was, then you return his farm to him and he returns your flock to you. In this way, we minimize and this man's got something to keep him going for the moment. And ultimately, he gets his farm back. Al-haqqu al ma qadayta ya bunayya. Oh my son, I salute what you say. Oh my son, I salute what you say. I retract, I revoke. Fafahamnaha Sulaiman. Fafahamnaha Sulaiman. Wa kullan atayna hukman wa ilma. Allah says, we, we inspired the correct verdict on the bosom of Sulaiman alayhi salam. But respectively, father and son were blessed with, with great knowledge. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا We blessed them and endowed them both with knowledge. So coming back to the point here, and I want to mention this and round up, on the aspect of, again, of structure. We're talking of time. In between, we flavor in it with some other things, but the key focus is how we need to have a timetable, an active timetable. That's it. This is the time I sleep. This is the time. My time for my deen. Aun ibn Abdullah describing the Sahaba said, يَجْعَلُونَ كَانُوا يَجْعَلُونَ لِلدُّنْيَا مَا فَضُلَ عَنْ آخِرَتِهِمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَجْعَلُونَ لِلدُّنْيَا وَأَنْتُمْ تَجْعَلُونَ لِلْآخِرَةِ مَا فَضُلَ عَنْ دُنْيَاكُمْ Big difference between us and the Sahaba. They channel their key resources to the preservation of Akhira. And if there was an overflow, they invested it in this world. You people... Channel everything, you as in us, channel everything in this world, and if anything remains which is unlikely, then it gets directed to Akhirah. So our core and key investment portfolio is this world. And if there is little extra time on a Sunday, Zohar, because the shop's got to be closed, so then probably you'll have a bigger attendance. Because why? Our key essence and our key investments is in the things of this world, while Sahaba's logic was the direct opposite, was the direct opposite. So anyway, Dawud alayhi salam, just, just reflect over this, brothers. He used to consciously, routinely uh, camouflage himself and go amongst the people and then ask them, brother, you know Dawud? So he would disguise himself. People heard about the name, but often you don't know this is the person himself. Say, yeah, I know Dawud. What's your opinion? Oh, he's a good man. He's a prophet. He's a, he's a ruler. And, oh, he's an awesome person. Lovely, lovely. What's your opinion? Completely camouflaged, disguised. And he wanted to know, this is also mentioned about Imam Malik. Imam Malik used to be very particular about the perceptions of people. Not perceptions of people like we have it. Our functions got to be elaborate because what will people say? You were in farewell to a janaza or you seen off a girl, a, a, a bride. What would people say? What would people say? This has eaten up our society. Uh, the other day on the radio they mentioned something. How many a marriages are suffering a blow and they are on the verge of being dissolved and probably... In, in reality, it's been dissolved, but you just supposedly together because society mustn't know the marriage broke. I mean, what a foolish way of living life. The Quran says, keep your spouse with respect or release her with dignity. But if it's not happening and you have to call it a day, you have to res dissolve it with respect. But purely, precisely, exclusively because of the norms of society, the standards of society. Uh, it's a taboo in society. It's a no-go in society. It's a stigma in society. Because of that, you're hanging on. So why hang on into something because of perception and notion? So not on that note of perception and notion, but rather on the note, that how I can better myself. Someone came to Hakim al-Umma rahimahullah, the great intellectual giant, and said, I must be honest and candid. I've been backbiting about you. Will you forgive me? He said, I'll forgive you provided you disclose what you were backbiting. Because as much as it's a sin for you to backbite, I could be guilty of what you said. So if you don't tell me, when will I reform? So it's a separate thing that even if I'm guilty, it's wrong for you to discuss it. وَيْلُ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ الْلُمَزَةِ Woe be to the one who speaks of ill on their face and behind their back. Some of us have the notion that we can legitimize our backbiting by pronouncing that evil on the man's face. That's not legitimizing it. That's making a different wrong. No, 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 no. I'm not only making ghibit. I'll tell him on his face. I'm not shy. Eh? I'll, yeah, I'll tell the man straight. The Quran says you are now double wicked. Tell Mizu to tell man on his face. Humazah to tell him behind his back. 
So that doesn't make it right. You're telling the man on his face or telling him behind his back to speak evil of people is not the thing that needs to be done. So anyway, Dawud was walking, long story short, and then he's, Allah sends an angel and he's camouflaged. And Dawud doesn't recognize this, the angel, and the angel knows this is Dawud And Dawud tells the angel, uh, brother, you know Dawud? Yeah, of course I know Dawud. What's your take on Dawud? Ah, Dawud's a good man, Dawud's a good man. But any, any setbacks, any, you know what, uh, blemish, any weakness? Yeah, this is one thing, he's drawing some funds from the national treasury. If he could have some independent income, I guess it would just give him an edge. It would just give him that much of a, you know, excellency to his personality. He was totally justified because a Khalifa can draw from the national treasury. And, and you can read about our history. Sayyidina Umar is on the pulpit and everybody gathers in the masjid. He said, listen, folks, I am sick and I've been diagnosed with a condition and the physicians have prescribed honey and there is some honey in the national treasury. I have assembled you because I need your collective consent if I can have one teaspoon honey. No man, Umar, you've been too sweet now. You've really been sweet. Subhanallah, can you imagine that? Beyond comprehension, beyond comprehension, the likes that is beyond our imagination. But when they were out to learn, so when they were told, they embraced it. So when he heard this, said, I appreciate it. And then he made dua to Allah that Allah inspire me with something that I can generate my own revenue. And that's the teachings of Islam, that a person, you know, generates his own income and he has his own wealth. من طلب الدنيا حلالا استعفافا عن المسألة سعيا على أهله تعتفا على جاره بعثه الله يوم القيامة ووجهه كالقمر ليلة البدر. Our faith was never a selfish religion. The day we became selfish, that is the day we lost our deen and our iman. Our entire Islam revolves around a selfless nature. And as soon as we become private and personal and exclusive and selfish, we've lost the essence of our faith. Islam was all about togetherness. La yu'min, la yu'min, la yu'min. He's not a genuine believer. Who owns a be of Allah if he's eating and his neighbor's belly is hungry? He's not a genuine. Owner be of Allah, our food is running short. La'allakum taftariqoon. I think you people are eating individually. He didn't say, what, pot, what size pot you cooking in? Huh? Which, which pot you got? No, no. Nabi Sallallahu said, I think you're eating individually. Start eating together. You'll see the food will be adequate. The food would be adequate. Then the Sahaba's internal taqwa is of another level. The blind Sahabi doesn't want to eat with the sighted because the blind feels I will eat more than others because I cannot see. The sighted doesn't want to eat with the blind. He says because the blind won't see, he'll eat less, I'll eat more. The crippled Sahabi doesn't want to eat in a joint get together. He says because I'll occupy more place because I'm crippled, I need to stretch my leg. The able Sahabi doesn't want to pool resources and eat with a cripple. Is it because a cripple will come late by the time half the food is finished? Allah revealed the verse. It's not harm in subjecting yourself to such stringent rules. Be relaxed and easy. Look at their level of taqwa. Each one concerned of the next. Yeah, we say, it's all right. That guy, he's still looking for a place. By that time, we wipe out, brother. He come late, tough luck. You lose, you, you, you snooze. You snooze, you lose. Nobody told you to come late. We gave you the address. We told you what time we're teaching out. Subhanallah, what a difference in life. Just look at their life and look at our life. What a difference. We were never selfish. The day we became selfish. Imagine if the dad passes on and the children sit down and each one enters the meeting of winding up the estate with the primary desire that my brothers and my siblings must get more. Imagine walking into that meeting with that mindset. That man's soul in his grave will be tranquilized that no Yasin and Tabarak will bring it that joy. That man's soul in his grave will be with brightened and will be full of joy and ha happiness. But here we're walking on. We don't pay. I, brother asked me, my dad passed away, please perform the salah. I performed it. 
I made to Allah forgive him, Allah elevate him. I barely said, Rahmatullah, Ya Rahman Rahimin. MashaAllah, you're making lavish duas, but a man owes me big time. Okay, brother, you <laughs> the cover here. Yeah, yeah, he owes me big time. Who? This man, yeah. Okay, brother, no problem. I just made a dua. I made a generous dua. You know, don't, don't attack the man. Don't attack the messenger. But there's the son. Inna li sahib al maqala. Inna li sahib al maqala. The one who has a right, he has a voice. The one who's owed, he has a leg to stand on. It might be insensitive. It might be brutal. It might be crude. It might be harsh. But in principle, you justified because you're going to die in a way where your ducks are in a row, your accounts are clean and cleared. Everything needs to be transparent. That's how you leave. Man bata wa huwa bari'um min al kibri wal ghululi wa dain. You die free of three. My Nabi said, direct jannat. Direct to jannah. Man bata, man mata wa huwa bari'um min al kibri, free from pride, deceit, and death. Straight to jannah. We're not dying guilty of one, we're dying guilty of all three. Allah protect us. Allah protect us. So anyway, he makes dua to Allah and then Allah inspires him with the skill of making armor. Now when Allah inspires him with the skill, Allah doesn't just say, okay, make armor. Allah gives him certain benefits, miracles. We had softened the steel for him. So for Dawud some steel was like how for us wax is. Simple, easy, he could turn it, you know, fold it, bend it. It was totally flexible. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made it easy for Dawud alayhi salatu wasalam. Then Allah goes on to say, and we come to that point of a schedule, a program, a schedule. I got to have this in order. Sunday is a lazy start. We become non-productive. We lose our whole focus. The Prophet ﷺ has made dua for the morning of the ummah, not the night of the ummah. What you can achieve in the morning, you cannot achieve in the latter part of the day. Because the morning is carrying the Du'as of the Prophet sallallahu Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. When a person goes to the masjid in the morning and the evening, Allah prepares, prepares and extends his hospitality. That, that is the time that a believer is up and active. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ani'mal sabighat. Prepare armor. And here again, we need to refute a myth. There is a myth out there that Islam is averse to professionalism. And that's also a myth and it's unfounded and it's not established in Islam. Islam doesn't say that because it's this world, you must just do it anyhow and you, you don't have to worry how you're doing things. No, no. Islam says you must be principled. Do things, do it thorough, do it proper. Don't attach your heart to it. Don't attach your heart to it. But it, uh, if you study the rule of Sayyidina Umar, he was the man who created Islamic infrastructure. He was the man who built barracks. He was the man who built bridges. He was the man who dug canals. He was the man who established an employed system for ulama and huffaz and mu'adhineen. He was the man who put up masajid. He was the man who promoted active literacy. At the time in the Arabs, there were only 16 literate people. Sayyidina Umar was one of those literate people. He promoted active literacy. So read the reign of Umar radiallahu anhu, you would be amazed by how much rich contribution he made to Islamic infrastructure. And all this credit goes to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, which we seldom read about. He had great, he, was, he had a very innovative mind, he had a very innovative mind. So constantly trying to innovate and move things ahead. But there was no attachment to it, that's the key. Allah told Dawud alayhi salam, make armor, do it thorough, do it with precision. Synchronize the links, synchronize the links. وَقَدِّرْ فِي السَّرْدِ Sarada in Arabic means to weave. Qaddir has two meanings and that's the one that I want to speak on. One could mean synchronize. So let there be rhythm, let there be pattern, let there not be inconsistency. Let there be pattern in it. Allah speaks about how Allah created the heavens. Allah says, look at the skies. فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ كَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبْ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرِ Only Allah can make that statement. Only Allah. Sometimes you look at something, it's a cursory glance. How was it? No, absolutely impressive. Look again. When you look again, then you realize the flaws and the mistakes. Now you don't want to depress the man. No, no, this is amazing. Amazing. Then you point out a mistake. You point out a mistake because you don't want to. You just want to keep the man happy. Allah says, look at my creation. Not once, not twice, but repeatedly. And Allah throws out a challenge. Your gaze will return defeated because my creation is flawless. 
ما ترى من خل ما ترى من خل ما ترى من تفاوت ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت أي عدم تناسب you will not spot inconsistency in anything that I create if you look at just the color combination that Allah has created وَمَا ذَرَأَ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُ look at the trees look at the fruit يُسْقَى بِمَا إِنْ وَاحِدْ Allah says it's one land it's one sun but just look at the variety in everything you look at the marine world you look at the marine world as we enjoy animals in the zoo and you enjoy animal in the park it's two different things when we were in the caribbean we went to in the submarine two three times and you go deep down 150 meters deep into the water and then you move deep into the ocean and you see the schools of fish and you see the marine world and you see the exotic fish and you see the color combination and you only marvel sometimes you look at these birds and you see the color you look at flowers you look at color i'm not talking of species and diversity just color combination so in everything of allah there's beauty allah says now when you put this armor then synchronize the links synchronize that's one mafum the second of series وَقَدِّرْ فِي السَّرْدِ Fix a time for this. Dawood, you asked us for a skill so that you can have financial independence. We inspired you with a skill. Build this year, design this year, make this year. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ صَنْعَةَ لَبُوسٍ لَكُمْ However, let this not consume all your time. قَدِّرْ Fix a time. That this is the time I would be doing this and then you leave it and your other time goes in ibadah. And immediately after that, Allah says, وَعْمَلُوا صَالِحَا That I've given you a skill and it's there to financially liberate you and make you independent. But it shouldn't be taking up the chunk of your time. Engage in good actions. Not to say that Dawud was not engaging in any good actions. And Allah had endowed and blessed and favored them with a lot of bounties. But in the end, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to Dawud alayhi salam? اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُودَ شُكْرًا and this is something to, to really reflect on if we can take this home. People say, you know, Allah has blessed me so much. That's good. A lot of homes you go to, they have hadha min fadli rabbi. This is the mercy of Allah. I normally say to the people, complete the ayah. لِيَبْلُوَنِي أَأَشْكُرُ am akfur. People stop. Midstream. The ayah doesn't stop there. This is the grace of Allah to test me if I'm grateful or I'm ungrateful. That, that is it. That's the reflection. Correct that you attribute this to Allah. But the bounty is to test you. So what did Allah say to Dawud alayhi salam? I've blessed you with this. Structure your time. Have a timetable in place. Some time for this. It shouldn't be consuming all your time. You do this, you move away. And another very important thing we learn from the greats of the world. When it comes to time, you engage in your practice daily of virtuous actions. Even if it means for a moment so that you don't interrupt pattern and rhythm. Hakimul Ummah rahimahullah, who was a great prolific author, who has authored no less than a thousand books and of rich compilation. He says, it was my practice daily to sit and write. If it occasionally my teachers and my mentor came home, I would sit him, entertain him, excuse myself, pick the pen and write so that I don't have a gap of two days where I lose my focus and my pattern. I would minimize my writing, but keep the action active. Keep the action active. The day you close the Quran and you didn't touch it, the next day it becomes more daunting. And the third day it becomes more daunting. And then forget about it. The Quran becomes for the shelf and not the self, as they say. We lose the touch totally. So don't break the rhythm. Don't let it be in, you know, have this gap and, and this gulf between the period. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam? I'amalu ala Dawood shukra. Oh, the people of Dawood, don't verbalize gratitude, execute it. Don't verbalize it, execute it. You say, hey, how, I don't know how to make shukr to Allah. That's the easy way to say it. Sometimes say, you know what? I don't know how to introduce this man because uh, he's so famous. One is probably an individual could be so famous, but on the other end, you're lazy to introduce. And you take shelter from his fame that I don't need to introduce. I don't have to introduce because he's too famous. One is to say, oh, you know what? I don't know how to thank Allah. And it's just an excuse because you don't actively thank Allah. Well, Ya Allah is saying the way forward to express gratitude to Allah is walk the talk. Walk the talk. 
And what's the minimum you can do in walking the talk? The ulama say is the minimum gratitude is you don't use the resources given to you by Allah in the disobedience of Allah. Imagine you buy yourself son a phone and he buys that, he takes that phone and then he sends you a nasty message from the phone you bought him. Now what's going to happen to you, my brother? You're going to be livid. You're going to be livid. You would lose your balanced composure regardless of calculated, methodical, composed individual you are. I mean, that's an audacity. That's an absolute audacity. That's ludicrous to do something of that nature, to take my phone, my, my asset that I've given you and have the audacity to send me a nasty message. Well, that's the minimum. Whatever Allah has given us, we don't abuse it by using it in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to make us amongst those people who structure our timetables, who have an active. We, we value and enjoy Ramadan apart from the blessings of the month because every person enters into rhythm. Every person enters into pattern. Allah says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitabam mawquta. We've ordained prayer with fixed times. This is it. Come, that's it. Drop and move on. That is why the ulama say that for us there are different times of salah. For us, there are different times, you know, there's Isfar when it is winter, sometimes it's early, etc. But women are encouraged to offer their prayer as soon as the time sets in across all seasons. Women are offered and exhorted and implored to offer their prayer because otherwise sometimes you're reading it in oval time, then it's makru time. It just depends how the activities of the house and the domestic chores are carried out. So if that is the environment, as soon as the time sets in, everything can just be put on hold and we can offer our prayer and we center our lives around that. We sleep early. We rise early. We have a timetable. We don't compromise on our timetable. We will see meaning in our day. We will see barakah in our day. We will see goodness in our day. Tamurru sa'atu ayyami bila nadamin wala khawfin wala bukain wala hazani. Anal ladhi yughliqu al-abwaab mujtahidan ala al-ma'asi wa aynu Allahi tanzuruni. It's long couplets in which the, the poet is lamenting the loss of time, that it's just running away from me. Imam Shafi said, if I summarize my entire life of studies, I can narrow it to two things. Your ego, either you dictate to it or it dictates to you. Either you telling yourself, I'm reading Quran, or then it will get you onto the paper or onto a site or peruse this or read this or gossip here or to do this. That's it. It's either you receiving or dictating. There's no neutral phrase. There's no neutral. Either you saying I'm doing or you've been dictated to. That's one. And number two, al waqtu sayfun qata'tahu aw qata'ak. Either you on top of time or it's on top of you. Either you exploiting it or it's exploiting you. May Allah grant us all the understanding. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره اللهم لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم فصل وسلم وبارك وزد وتحنن وترحم على حبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين O oh, most kind, most gracious, most merciful Allah, we beg you, we beseech you, we implore you through the agency of Ismul A'zam, your supreme name via which all prayers are answered Allah. We ask you to grant us barakah in our day Allah. We ask you to grant us barakah in our lives Allah. We ask you to grant us barakah in our provisions Allah. We ask you to grant us goodness and barakah and blessings in all the assets that you have blessed us with Allah. Allah, give us the ability to structure our days and our nights, Allah. Let our nights be there to converse with you, Allah. Make us amongst those, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ That when we're done with the chores of the day, Allah, we stand in prayer and we stand فَانْصَبْ until there's a degree of fatigue that grips us, O oh Allah. Make us amongst those, Allah, that we can spend with our right hand, which our left hand doesn't know, Allah. Make us amongst those people, O oh Allah, that we can spend extended hours in the masjid, that we are amongst those, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسْجِدِ O oh Allah. O oh Allah, save us from indulging in futile talk, O oh Allah. Save us from those who indulge in samura ba'd al-isha, in social discussions and gossips, killing time, wasting time, O oh Allah. Make us amongst those who value and capitalize every moment of our time, O oh Allah. Make us amongst those people, O oh Allah, that every moment is channeled objectively for the advancement of the deen and for deliverance of our soul from the fire of Jahannam, O oh Allah. We ask from you all the good that Muhammad had asked from you, O oh Allah. 
and we ask thy divine protection from all the evils from which Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had asked protection. Allah, you preserve this community, O oh Allah. You preserve this masjid. You pre preserve the people of this place, the well wishers, Allah. You grant muhabba and understanding in the residents of this place, in the citizens of this place, Allah. In in the people who attend this masjid and this prayer place, O oh Allah. Allah, those of our children that are studied in the adjacent school, Allah. You make them great soldiers and flag bearers, Allah. Allah, let them become great uh, great assets to the Muslim ummah. Let them serve Islam and the Muslims on all fronts, O oh Allah. Let them excel academically and Islamically, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you to let peace reign on the planet, O oh Allah. Allah, wherever there is mayhem and anarchy and killing and murder in Allah, you grip the hands of the tyrants and the butchers, O oh Allah. Allah, you stop their oppression and aggression, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, you respond to the cry and the plea of the innocent, Allah. Allah, on the horn of Africa, people are in severe hunger in Somalia currently, Allah. And even locally, O oh Allah, give us the ability to respond to the call and to dig deep and respond to the crisis, O oh Allah. We ask you to preserve the bounties you have given us, Allah. Allahumma la tanzi' minna salih ma a'taytana. Allah, don't seize or snatch the bounties you have given, from, given us, O oh Allah. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min zawali na'amatik wa tahawuli afiyatik wa fuja'ati niqmatik wa jami'i sakhatik. O Allah, you free our youth from the scourge of sitting on these devices for extended hours, Allah. Allah, it has eaten them, it has destroyed them, it has paralyzed them, it has maimed them, Allah. It has made them dysfunctional, Allah, both from a material and a spiritual perspective. They have lost the touch of human social interaction, Allah. They have lost the focus of prayer and productivity, O oh Allah. Allah, give us the ability to use these innovations as a source of goodness, Allah. Let it not overpower us or overwhelm us or consume us, O oh Allah. Make us amongst those who use it to, to advance the cause of deen, O oh Allah. اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من كل شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله